better. We are in the middle of a series called Battleground, Battlefield, War. We've been talking about Ephesians chapter 6 and how we are fighting against the satanic forces of darkness. We are fighting against Satan himself. And I know last week's sermon um, was hard to swallow because it revealed some very dark things that go on in our world. But we as Christians, we're not called to flee from forces of darkness. We are called to stand up against them. We are called to fight back. And it starts with knowledge and knowing what goes on and understanding Satan's schemes. You know the word scheme is actually used in ancient literature as a word for lying in wait, to spring a trap, to ambush someone. And so if you were going to scheme against someone, you would lay out your battle plans and then you would execute it perfectly. And so Satan has laid out his battle plans against us. He is a real spiritual force. There are real spiritual forces of darkness that have waged war against us. And we as Christians, we are confident that we have won the war because of the victory through Jesus Christ. But that doesn't mean we don't face individual battles as a person, as a Christian, and also as a church. Satan is scheming against us. He has organized his battle plans against us. And the Bible calls us to put on the armor of God so that we can stand. And you know, sometimes when we think about the armor of God, we think about the classroom as a child, and we march around, and we sing those joyful songs. But the reality is, is this is a battle cry to war. This is not a children's song. This is not a half-hearted, joyful thing with a little cartoon character that we color in. This is a call to war. I looked up some famous battle cries, and I've shared some of these before, and there have been some wild ones, but basically a battle cry is a chant. It is a saying, it is a phrase that readies the troops, that calls them into battle. And there have been famous battle cries through almost every war. One of my favorite ones is by Patrick Henry in 1775, and many of you know this, when Patrick Henry stood up before Congress and he said this immortal line, I know not what cause others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. Famous battle cry, willing to go to war um, against the imposing forces on the United States of America. And there's been a lot of famous battle cries. Paul's famous battle cry is found in Ephesians 6. And so if you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians 6. That's where we're going to be today. You know, last week, we talked obviously about the idea that Satan is scheming against us, but we are not called to flee in fear. We are called to stand in power. And the result of standing up to Satan and the spiritual forces of darkness is that we will begin to reform and refine our character. We will become more holy, more loving, more like Jesus when we put on the armor of God and we stand. But then we'll also find this. We will begin to weather the storms of Satan that are waged against us. And so Satan comes and he whispers in our ear, you cannot fight the storm. And when we put on the armor of God, we are able to shout back, I am the storm through the victory that is found in Jesus Christ. And so I hope that you'll be encouraged to put on the entire armor of God. The first thing that we talked about last week was truth. Truth is that which corresponds to reality. And what Satan wants to do, his scheme against us, is to manipulate it. There is no such thing as truth. And so we see things like, it's absolutely true, there is no such thing as absolute truth. And so we shout back to Satan, is that an absolute truth? Or when it's said, all truth is relative, we shout back, is that a relative truth? Or something of this nature. He wants to make truth harsh and cold and without love, and so we develop this attitude. Well, I just tell it like it is. And if you can't accept what I have to say, then that's your problem and not mine. No, the Bible tells us to speak truth and love. And so it is his scheme and his ambition to eradicate truth. And if he can't eradicate it, he wants to make it harsh and cold and mean-spirited and without the love and the grace that we find in the gospel. He wants to strip us and distort what is true and what is wholesome and what is right. And so Paul says, put on the belt of truth. That's part of the armor of God. And then we also talked about the breastplate of righteousness. Satan wants nothing more than to scheme against you to get you to live an unholy and unrighteous life. He wants you to sin. He wants you to fall short of the glory of God. He wants to prevent you from doing what is right. And so his scheme is first and foremost to attack your personal righteousness. 
And then secondly, he wants to disassociate you from the righteousness that we have in Christ. He wants you to think that if you can't measure up, you might as well just give up. That you have to earn your way. You have to earn your keep. He wants to eradicate the gospel of grace to get you to establish righteousness on your own behalf and with your own character. But we know the Bible tells us that we have the righteousness of Christ. We get Jesus' righteousness credited to our account. And so Paul says, if you are going to stand strong against Satan's schemes, you must put on the breastplate of righteousness. It protects your internal organs. It keeps you alive. And when you have the righteousness of Christ, you can live and you can stand. These are his battle plans. But we can't just put on part of the armor. We've got to put the whole thing on. Now, I am guilty of watching Christmas movies already. Okay? You all already know this about me. I'm a Christmas fan, and so we've already started watching Home Alone. And I actually prefer Home Alone 2 over Home Alone 1. It's one of the few times where the second, in my opinion, was better than the first. Usually the second movies just aren't really that great. Um, the first is always the best. But Home Alone 2 is my favorite, and every scene is just awesome, especially when you get to the point where the battle takes place. These two morons try to find where Kevin is, and they enter this abandoned house, and they, Kevin has just laid out a battle plan absolutely perfectly. And my favorite part is um, when Marv is downstairs in the basement, and he slips on the paint, and he does this entire ordeal, and he falls down, and this big pile of paint just covers his entire body. I mean, can you imagine actually just shooting that scene in the movie? That would just be awful, but it's by far my favorite scene. And so he just shrieks out loud, and he's trying to wipe the paint from his face, and so he's able to get one eye open, and then he finds some paper towels, and he brushes his face off, and then he goes over to get some water, and of course, Kevin, he's laid out his battle plans, right? And so he's, he's hooked up electricity to the water, and uh, it shocks him. And then finally, after he's, he's been through all of that, he is able to find a rope that's been conveniently strung through the holes in this three-level apartment in New York City. And of course, Marv is stupid. And so he goes up to the rope, and he tests it. You guys know what I'm talking about? He tests it, and he's like, you can just see the smile on his face. I have found a way up. And of course, he jumps up on the rope, pulls it down, 100-pound bag of cement falls on his head and knocks him out. I mean, it's just one thing after another. But we associate somebody like Marv um, or Harry as people who are ill-prepared. But yet Kevin is ready for war. And if we as Christians are going to be ready for war, we need to put on the full armor of God. And Paul has laid that out nicely for us. And so if you're in Ephesians chapter 6, let's look at the, the rest of the armor of God, starting in verse 15. He says, I want you to put on shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. A Roman soldier, and that's the picture here is of, of, of a soldier. A Roman soldier actually had a boot that would be about halfway up the calf. And on the bottom would be several layers of leather with spikes like our modern cleats today. And there would be spikes on the bottom in order for him to be able to stand if he were to fight the enemy. They were able to fight in any terrain, in any territory, because of the kind of shoes that they had equipped. And there would be leather straps that would be wrapped up around the ankle. And so the foot would be open, the bottom would be covered, and there would be spikes on the bottom. In the wintertime, they would shove wool, actually, uh, around the straps in order to keep their feet warm. And so that's the picture. The gospel of peace gives us the ability to stand strong. And if you know anything about fighting or boxing, you will know that footwork is everything. How you position your feet. If, for instance, you overextend yourself when you're throwing a punch, you're going to be easily caught. You're going to be thrown off balance. And so you could take a big old man who doesn't know how to fight, and you take a wee little man who knows how to fight. The one who knows how to fight is going to win because it's all about his footwork. Your power in football and boxing, your power comes from your feet. It comes from your legs. And so if we are going to stand against Satan in his schemes, we've got to have a strong footing. We've got to be able to withstand when he pushes against us. And so Paul calls it this, the gospel of peace. It gives us this firm foundation. And here's what it means. Here's the whole point of the footwear. The Roman soldiers established this kind of footwear, and if you know anything about the Roman army, so that they could travel quickly. Not just so that they could stand, 
The Roman army was well known for being able to travel a long distance in a short amount of time, all because of the kind of footwear that they were equipped with. In other words, they were prepared. They were ready. They were ready for anything. Any kind of action that would come their way, their feet were always equipped and ready for battle. And here's the thing, without footwear, we're relaxed. We are at ease. We're not expecting any type of battle or any type of fight. But when we put on the gospel of peace, we are ready for war. And here's the irony. It's called the gospel of peace, but the point of the gospel of peace is for us to be ready for war. You know, I love the United States military. It's awesome. One of the greatest forces on the earth that we have ever seen and that we have ever known. The greatest military in the history of the world. They can make it around the world like that. I mean, we are ready at any moment's notice for a battle. We're prepared. It's actually one of the reasons why people don't want to mess with the United States of America is because of our military. And so here's how we should think of it. We have peace because we're strong. People don't want to try to take advantage of us because they know they will be met with the most horrific might that the world has ever seen if you mess with the United States military. Wouldn't that be amazing if we prepared ourselves in such a way that when Satan looked at us, he said, yeah, I'm not going to go there. Not worth my time. Not going to work. Too prepared, too strong, too ready. I mean, you want to talk about the damage that could be done to my spiritual forces of darkness. I am not messing with this person. That's what the Bible's teaching us. To be ready, to be strong, to be willing to go to war because of what is true. That's why Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 4 2, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, which means encourage, with complete patience and with teaching. To equip ourselves with the armor of God is to study the gospel and be ready to use it at a moment's notice. It's like a husband waiting on his wife to finish getting dressed. We are called to be ready because you never know when the time will come. <laughs> Isn't that bad? I'm sorry. Sorry, that's, you know, it's a bad dad joke. But we, yeah, yeah. But we need to be ready to preach the gospel. That's fine. It's true. We need to be ready to preach the gospel. And so when you sin, Satan wants to whisper, God doesn't love you. When you make a mistake, Satan wants to whisper, you are such a failure. Why do you even try? And if we are prepared with the gospel of peace, we will say, no, not today, Satan. Your whispers don't have any measure or any weight with me. I am at peace with God. God has bridged the gap between myself and my sins and a relationship with him. I can stand firm in the knowledge that I am at peace with God. I am justified. I am saved. And no whisper of yours is going to change that. That is the gospel of peace. We are called to be ready. But if we can't be ready, if we're not prepared... Verse 16 says this, not only have the gospel of peace like the boots, but in all circumstances take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. The word uh, for shield here is actually the word that they use for a door. Most shields in antiquity, they were round, they were smaller, but the Roman shield was about the size of a door, four feet high, and it was as wide as a man. And what they would do is they would line up shoulder to shoulder, and they would create this structure with their shields that it would be impenetrable. And one of the other things that they would do is they would take leather, often sometimes up to seven layers, they would wrap it around the shield, they would drench it in water, so that when an arrow was shot at them that was lit on fire, it would be extinguished just like that. And so imagine this Roman force. The only thing you can do is shoot arrows at them. You can light them on fire and shoot arrows at them, but they have built their shields in such a way in front, on top, from the sides, that there's nothing that you can do to stop the invasion. That's how important the shield was to the Roman army. And so when they would attack a city, they would cover their shields with leather and they would be an unstoppable force and they would march forward but notice this you never had a Roman soldier take his shield and just run at the city reckless abandonment the power was in their numbers they marched together the Christian church can be an unstoppable force when we march together with the shield of faith and so the idea of a shield here is that it protects us whatever Satan throws at us can be deflected because of our shield of faith. So what are Satan's fiery arrows? What is he shooting at you? Temptation, greed, lust, 
jealousy, hatred, pride, laziness, discouragement, despair. The reality is this, faith is our victory. It is the means by which we are saved through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if Satan fires too many arrows and he just bombards you to where the light is blocked out, then we will fight in the shade with the, field, with, with the shield of faith. Here's what's cool. Satan cannot take our shield from us. And so here's his tactic. If I can discourage you and make you afraid to where you lay your shield down yourself, now my arrows can hurt you. And so he uses fear. He uses false doctrine. He uses manipulation. He uses discouragement. He uses church hurt. People hurt each other in the church. If, if he can get you to drop your shield of faith, his arrows can really do damage. Adolf Hitler, the embodiment of a satanic spiritual dark force, said this, it is always more difficult to fight against faith than against knowledge. There's something about faith that makes it really hard to defeat. What is faith? Faith is not belief in something that you can't see. Faith is not belief in spite or in absence of evidence. Faith is really listed in two components. First of all, it's mental assent to logical facts. We believe certain logical facts, like Jesus resurrected from the dead. What is our mental assent based off of? Historical truth, historical facts. The reason why I'm a Christian is not because I believe in spite of evidence, it's because I believe because of evidence. I believe that Jesus resurrected from the dead because of the historical arguments for the resurrection. And then my conviction for the things that I don't see are now based off of what I do see. For instance, I believe that we will resurrect from the dead, and I believe that we will spend forever with God in the new heavens and the new earth. I believe in the unseen because of the logical reasoning for the resurrection. And so faith is first and foremost mental assent to logical facts, but then faith is also trust. Trust is reflected in what you do and the behavior of your life. It's like going to a doctor, and if you trust a doctor, you put your physical well-being and your life in their hands. An illustration that I often give is I have a, an extreme fear of heights. And so if you see some crazy person walking across the Grand Canyon on a tightrope, and you've seen him do it a thousand times, you probably would wager that he can do it a thousand and one. That's mental assent. That's belief. I believe this. But if you trust, you'll let him carry you across the Grand Canyon. And that's the difference. Trust is letting God carry you through life. Trusting when he says something, it is true, it is right, it is dependable. And so our shield of faith is anchored in logic. It is anchored in truth. It is anchored in the evidence that we see. Paul put it like this in Hebrews 11.1, 1, Now faith is the assurance of what we hope for and the certainty of what we do not see. Greek word for faith is pistis. It literally means to be persuaded by evidence. And that's what we have as Christians. We have evidence. And so we believe certain facts about God, and we allow those facts to transform and change our life. And it is because of our faith that we trust in what we cannot see. Satan schemes against us. He wants to rob us of what is true. He wants to rob us of our faith because he wants to cut us off from our relationship with God. Faith urges us believe, to believe, and he, if he can get us to drop our shields, he wins. And so faith reminds us that God is true, and he keeps his promises. Faith means that we are justified. It literally means that in all circumstances, Paul says, we should take up the shield of faith. That literally means when things are good or when they're bad. When you're being schemed against or when you're being left alone. In all circumstances. Take up the shield of faith. Faith provides what is essential to our life. That's why Paul said in Romans 5, look at this. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into his grace in which we stand. We stand in the grace of God, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. This is why faith is so important. It is the means of our justification, and it enables us to stand in the grace of God. And so when the whisper of Satan says, you are not saved, how could you really know? Do you have enough faith? Have you really done the right things? Are you really good enough? We shout back, I am saved by grace through faith. 
That's the good news of the gospel. And so we invade enemy territory and we engage in, in battle with him with our shield of faith together. And it protects us from Satan's attacks. Look at verse 17 in Ephesians 6. Finally, he says, take up the helmet of salvation. This helmet was made of bronze and they would have a chin strap. It would literally cover their jaws and their ears and it would be strapped uh, to their chin. And the reason why a helmet is so important is because it protects the brain. The brain is the command center of the body. And without the head, the body's useless. It is the assurance of our salvation that makes us an impenetrable force and it protects us against the enemy. That's why he called it the helmet of salvation. If I can convince you that you are not saved, I can destroy every other element of the armor of God. The helmet of salvation is our command center. When we fail to view our sin and our lives and our future through the eyes of salvation, our world is distorted. And so the Christian soldier is protected by this helmet. Satan's scheme is to undermine your salvation. Did God really save a person like you? Did he really keep his promise? Can you really trust that when God says, I send your sins as far as the east is from the west, is that true? Is it really true that God has forgiven you of your sin? Is it really true that when God looks at you, he hammers down the gavel as a judge and says, not guilty? And so we hear these whispers, these questions this doubt of our salvation and it robs us of the assurance of salvation. Assurance is not a dirty word. The assurance of our salvation is a biblical doctrine that is taught by Paul. We can be assured that we are saved because we have a very clear plan of salvation. Have you obeyed the gospel? Do you continue to walk in faith? It literally is that simple. And so when we believe certain facts about who God is and we allow those facts to change our life, we can be assured what the Bible teaches about the assurance of salvation. Dr. Jack Cottrell writes this, assurance is not the same as once saved, always saved. It is a confidence in our present security in Jesus Christ. And so the doctrine of assurance has been transformed by some into this idea that you can't revoke or give up or walk away from your salvation. That God will take you to heaven kicking and screaming even if you've revoked his salvation and you've turned to Satan. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches. The assurance of our salvation gives us confidence that when God says no penalty for you, we can accept it. You see, Satan's scheme is to get you to focus on your sin, not your salvation. It's to get your mind in the gutter, not on the glory of God. And if he can transform how you think about yourself, he can transform what you do. Have you ever noticed when it's easy, when you eat one donut, it's easy to eat two? When you sin in one way, it's, it's kind of easy to do it again. You tell one lie, two lies, really isn't that big of a deal. How many of you destroyed your diet and you're like, this day's a waste, <laughs> right? I mean, we do stuff like that. When you fall once, it's easy to fall again. And so if we are assured of our salvation, we maintain the right mindset. We are secure in the work of Jesus Christ. When we are under grace, God saves us. He forgives us 100% because of the blood of Jesus Christ. He doesn't treat us like we deserve. Our sins are covered and they are hidden. And so Paul says, put on the armor of God, the helmet of salvation, the command center of your body. And as you wage war against Satan and his schemes, understand this, you are saved and you can have the assurance of your salvation. He can't strip it or take it away from you. If we believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God, if we believe in Jesus as the Son of God, we can put our life in his hands, just like we put our life in the hands of a physician. Paul put it like this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 8 through 11. He says, but since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and of love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, that's exactly what the enemy wants you to believe. You are destined for the wrath of God. And he's always up in heaven, ready to whip that lash anytime you make a mistake. He's ready to punish you and give you what you deserve. And then Paul goes on to say this. He has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us 
so that whether we are awake or asleep, in other words, whether we're alive or dead, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are also doing. I can't tell you how many times I've talked with people who have become a Christian earlier on in their life, in their childhood, and they begin to doubt their salvation. Did I really understand the commitment that I was making? Was I really assured of who Jesus was and what he expected for my life? Did I really understand what it meant to be baptized? Why did I make this commitment? And so I will encourage them, look, we are not saved by our confusion or by our personal state of mind now that we're a mature Christian, based on how we're an immature Christian, we are saved through the promises of God. And if we have obeyed the gospel, there's nothing that you should fear. But then I say this, if your conscience is working against you, if you are in doubt in any way, shape, or form, be baptized. Why are you waiting? Don't delay. Obey the gospel. Be assured. We should have the assurance of our salvation. It should be something that we can walk through in life. I was a person who was raised in the Church of Christ, and Hellfire and Brimstone was pretty much preached every Sunday uh, by a really good man. Uh, I loved the man who, who, who preached to us, and he was my father in the faith at the time. But I couldn't help but develop this idea of insecurity. I felt like my salvation was a spiritual yo-yo. One moment I was saved based on performance, the next moment I was unsaved because I just didn't feel very good about myself because I messed up and I sinned. It's called Galatianism. It's why the book of Galatians was written. Grace gets you saved, but what you do keeps you there. And that is absolutely untrue. The same thing that got you saved, faith, is the same thing that keeps you saved, faith. And so if you are struggling in your own conscience and in your own mind, I want to encourage you. Obey the gospel. Be baptized in Jesus' name. Receive the assurance of your salvation. But if you have obeyed the gospel, don't look back. Don't doubt God's promises for you. Don't doubt God's love for you. Trust in the Lord. Trust in the hope of your salvation. Do not believe that God is ready to crack the whip on you just because you've messed up and you've made mistakes. The same grace that was available to you when you were baptized into Christ is the same grace that's available to you today. But if you haven't obeyed the gospel, how can you ever be sure? If you haven't been baptized, in Jesus' name. How can you ever be assured of your salvation? How can you fight back against the spiritual forces of darkness? How can you carry on the hope of your salvation? Because the only thing that's ever going to be presented to you is wrath and judgment and condemnation. And so my encouragement to you, if you have not placed your faith or your trust in Jesus, if you have not obeyed baptism and turned away from your sins, I want to encourage you to do that and begin to wage war against the spiritual forces of darkness that are attacking you and our world and our culture. World War II history, I'll end with this story, is like one of my favorites, okay? I, whenever I played video games as a young man, World War II games, they were my favorite. My dad was really into Civil War stuff. I like World War II. Winston Churchill, to me, was the man. And one of my favorite quotes by Winston Churchill was this. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields, in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender. And that's the attitude that we should have. We will never surrender. And so Hitler ultimately lost the war. Why? because he couldn't fight against faith. He couldn't fight against conviction. And yeah, you can tell somebody a lie, and sooner or later enough, if you tell it to them enough, it's basic 101 of psychology. You send a message out long enough, you'll believe it. But when you have the shield of faith, when you have the helmet of salvation, when you have the feet of the gospel of peace, you can stand. My encouragement to you is to put on the armor of God and stand and fight and never surrender. Let's stand.